If you're at a small enough scale, serverless is probably the best thing cloud has to offer. Reduced costs, you just pay for things you use, you don't pay for over provisioning and so on, and everything just works, right? Even if you're writing bad code, memory leaks, your functions are crashing, doesn't really impact production. Moreover, if you look at providers like Vercel or even AWS, these services have got really good at deploying your code with one click, right? So you just create a function, you just deploy it over there, and it just starts working. Despite all the good things serverless has to offer, let me tell you why at Fermion, we are moving away from serverless now. So Fermion's architecture works in a split way. The first is the front end, which is what you see over here when you refresh this page, let's say this page gets loaded and the second one is back end, right? So when I refresh this page over here, you can see there's a loading indicator here for a split couple of seconds that gets the information about what to show here, right? So if I open this website in an incognito tab, so here, for example, you can see I see the price of a specific course. However, if I go back and if I look at this, because I am logged in in this specific case, I get a different view, right? So the shell or most of the things which is static, we just render it ahead of time and the dynamic parts we get from the server, right? So the server over here is exactly what CodeDamps or Fermion's backend server is, right? So if I hop into the networks tab and if I start to look into this, you can see these couple of API calls which are getting made every single time, right? Something we need from the backend is requested. So this whole backend no longer works on serverless now. Now, of course, this is one of the websites which is built with Fermion. There are other websites also, but all of those websites use a common shared backend, right? Which is powered by Fermion. So let me show you a little bit about how things work. So under Fermion, there are many domains, right? Codeeater.pro, for example. Let's say we have a few more domains example over here up to let's say about 50, 51 websites, right? Now, all of these websites over here, all of them share a common backend, which is on backend.codedam.com, right? So all of them share a common backend, which internally shares a common database, right? And obviously access controls are there. So the data actually is not shared among other schools, right? So everything, all the access layers are there, but the basic idea, the basic architecture is that all the schools share all the backend resources and databases, right? In our specific case, this part of the equation has always been on AWS Lambda until yesterday. So what we did is that we removed this AWS Lambda part completely and replaced it with real monolithic servers. And let me tell you why. AWS has this very nice tool where you can just you know, calculate pricing of a specific feature. So let's say if we are trying to look for Lambda and we are trying to make sense of pricing, right? So how that would look like. So in our case, what we typically get on this backend now is close to 50 million requests a month. Right. And this is growing. Right. So this uh, what you also have to consider is that this number keeps on growing every month. So what we are getting is somewhere around this and duration of each request in milliseconds is something which is also, you know, a bad thing about AWS serverless in general, because let's say if this is AWS Lambda, one of the things which is good about Cloudflare workers is that Cloudflare workers bill you on the CPU used. It doesn't bill you when your IO is happening, right? So your CPU is not getting used. However, AWS Lambda just bills you for the full duration, even though AWS can technically share the CPU while it's waiting for you know, a network request or a database call or something. So this over here, on average, I don't exactly remember what this number was, but probably around close to 100 milliseconds on average. And the memory we need for this is one gigabyte, right? And a thermal storage, we don't need much. So that's 512 is free, of course. So that's there. So you can see over here, it has reached to a point where it's costing us close to $90. Now remember that this is just the cost of Lambda. It doesn't include cost of data transfer, right? And data transfer on AWS Lambdas is priced similar to how EC2 data transfer works, which is like, I think nine cents per GB. Now, if we grow this by an order of 10 as a magnitude, which is from going from 50 million requests a month to 500 million requests a month, which is definitely possible, right? Because at Fermion, we are growing, we are partnering up with every single school. So imagine like you, if you create your own academy, right? The other day, like this, let's say this 51st academy is your academy. And this is like a big school, 
which is driving like you know millions of users a month or it, if not millions at least hundreds of thousands of users or page views a month now even though the whole thing the whole infrastructure is same but you have easily like you know increased the volume by a significant amount right now this is not an accurate math but let's say if this 50 million needs to be divided across 40, 50, whatever school there are. So it's like a million users or a million, on average, you are adding a million requests a month per school, right? So we just need a few hundred more schools to sign up with to cross a 500 million request, right? And in reality, it would be probably far less than that, just a few schools. Once we cross that number, you're gonna see that it jumps to a thousand dollars a month in cost, which then starts to become a pain point, right? For a small startup like us. However, over here, even if you get like a very soft solid machine, EC2 machine, which has like, you know, eight cores and 64 GB RAM, something like this. This over here has a few advantages. First of all, it can run node eight times, right? Because it has eight cores, it can run this setup of node eight times and every single core would be able to distribute the workload of, you know, if an incoming request is coming on the server, it should be able to distribute it properly, right? So it's more about engineering effort at this point than anything else because the cost for us clearly, even at this scale right now, where we are at, where we are clo paying close to $100 a month for just AWS Lambda, we have basically crossed that threshold of, you know, having Lambda as a great option for us compared to the amount of time or amount of energy which we have to spend for maintaining the infrastructure. Now remember that if our architecture was only something like this, it would have been okay, right? But at Fermion, we do a few more things, right? We have to go out of the way to set up architecture for coding labs, for example. If you're doing live classes, we have the full custom architecture for that. If you are, you know, accepting payments, we do that. So all of these things we have, we are already doing outside, some parts outside of backend, some parts within backend. So it's not like we are doing something or we are going ahead and trying to save just a few dollars over here, right? Not just 10, $12 over here are getting saved. It's a huge amount of effort. Plus the approach of this, having a machine like this effectively leaves us not vendor logged into any platform, right? So, so far what we have been is we have been vendor logged into AWS Lambda because the way it has been built, right? Very convenient, very nice to use. Very cheap also if you are, you know, less than 50 million, 100 million requests a month, but it's effectively vendor logged in. That's the biggest thing. The next biggest thing, which most people would not talk about if you look at normal videos, AWS Lambda versus, you know, EC2 instance and so on. The first one, let me just clarify, this is the pricing, which is a big factor. The second one, which most people don't talk about a bit is small background tasks, right? And this is this is something which I'm telling you by experience, you would 100% not know this or be able to guess this if you're just working on your own in your own small project. What happens with Fermion is that in a lot of these resolvers, we need to perform some sort of background tasks. Now let me give you a quick example. Let's say I am editing one of this course, right? Let's say let me open this landing page. First of all, so let's say I'm editing this course, right? Where I can customize the description, metadata and everything. So over here, the, like this is a custom page. Now, when I change this text and I hit save button over here, you see it took a couple of seconds, right? But if I refresh over here, you can see that the page is updated. So that's fine, it's worked. How did it work exactly when this page is server rendered, right? So one of the things which we do is that we server render this page, but we also cache it so that the next time you load it, it loads under 50 milliseconds, right? At 50 to 100 milliseconds. But the revalidation, which we do, like, you know, we have to remove the cache, that does not happen synchronously. Now, right now this interface is like auto save, so you will not feel a lot, but imagine if it was an interface where it would just block your whole thing until the whole response has been returned, this would be a problem, right? So if I remove this again, and if I save this, the time it's taking right now to go to the server, come back and tell me that it has performed the save operation does not include the revalidation of the specific page, right? Because we are doing that revalidation in background. So it's a small background task. And AWS Lambda has one way to run background tasks, right? So I'm not saying that AWS Lambda does not support supports that. AWS Lambda does support background tasks, right? You can configure it, but it's a nightmare to do that in Google Cloud Run functions, right? So just take my word for it. 
you don't have to you know google this or anything you would not even find i think there is not a lot of information but google cloud run is the absolute worst if you want to support small amount of background tasks where you want to just send the response first to the end user and just do something in the background later aws lambda supports that but with a caveat that this Lambda function can only run for up to 15 minutes in background, right? One of the limitations which we have now overcome with this is that if we are hosting our own servers, we can just run background tasks for as long as we want, right? Because it's a server, it's just staying there. Now, one limitation which you obviously have is that this is not scalable. What happens if, you know, a lot of requests or a lot of people come in? Well, so things like these can be solved in a smart way. Now, I won't get into how exactly we solve it at Fermion, but the way you can solve it, one of the implementations we use a close enough implementation is that you can hybrid, you can use a hybrid solution. So you can use preserved VMs like, you know, pre-booked VMs or whatever you want to call it, like from Hertzner and all, to run the expected workload. But at the same time, you can combine this whole approach with platforms like AWS, right? Because why not? Because if you are hosting on AWS already before, these platforms are known to scale up and scale down very quickly. So you can keep the reserved expected load. For example, you expect that, you know, at a given point, you would have no more than let's say 10 requests a second or 20 requests a second. So even if you do a little bit of math, let's say if we do a little bit of math over here, so 10 requests a second means these many in a minute, this much in an hour, this much in a day, and this is the amount of requests you do in a month, right? That's one tens, 100,000, 10,000, 100,000, million, 10 million, so 25 million. So it's, it's very close to how many requests we actually do right now. So, right, we are doing about 50 million requests. So it just goes up at peak times and comes down at night and all. But effectively, this is what we are doing about right now, right? And if you have a machine like this, you know, Node can obviously handle more than one request a second, right? It can handle hundreds of requests, thousands of requests also a second. So that's, it's not usually a problem, right? Even if this is like a hundred requests per second, I'm pretty sure a machine with eight cores of Node, and unless you are not doing anything crazy, with the HTTP handling, it's just a simple database call, things like that, you would be easily able to handle it just on a one machine. But let's say if this exceeds, like, you know, you're, not get, you're getting 1000 requests a second or 10,000 requests a second, you can always create a fallback, right, to the cloud providers because that is where the power of cloud comes in, that you can scale it up and down basically indefinitely. So yeah, but anyway, that's pretty much it. Now we are no longer using AWS lambdas for our backend. I mean, a side effect of this is that the performance would also increase, right? Because now, because your Node.js process is long running, your JIT compiler has more time to optimize it, right? As it's learn, as it's running, it can read and understand its behavior, how the code is getting executed. And if you have written good amount of code, you can, you know, also get JIT optimized performance for it. So that's like another benefit which you will get. But anyway, that's pretty much it for this video. Hopefully you learned something new. That's all for this one. I will see you in the next video really soon.